welcome back to the Tapestry Effect. This is the second part of our look at the colonial leaders of New Jersey and the Quakers. And uh, funnily enough, we came here because I was researching my own hometown in the UK, Barks, Maidenhead. And then I happened upon a link that uh, took me to a Maidenhead in the States. We then looked at that and... Uh, it took us to uh, the fact that it was later named Lawrenceville. In, this is in New Jersey. And Lawrenceville had been named by Captain James Lawrence. It took us to Hunterdon County, where we saw that Robert Hunter was the namer of that place. And that he was actually from Ayrshire, Scotland, which is the seat and home of the Hunterdon family, or the Hunter family. We also saw that Morris County had been named by Lewis Morris. And the same for William Penn and Pennsylvania. And I found some interesting correlations, not just with those places being named by the colonisers, but also other names and links to things in Berkshire, such as uh, Baron Lovelace in Hurst, who also owned Lady Place in Hurley. There was a link to him. He was also a colonial governor of New York and New Jersey. And so was Colonel John Redding, which is also a town in Berkshire. But anyway. So a few more things to mention here. In Philadelphia, Francis Daniel Pastorius negotiated the purchase of 15,000 acres from his friend William Penn, the proprietor of the colony, and laid out the settlement of Germantown. The German Society of Pennsylvania was established in 1764 and is still functioning today from its headquarters in Philadelphia. Francis Daniel Pastorius was a German-born educator, lawyer, poet, and public official. He was the founder of Germantown, Pennsylvania, now part of Philadelphia, the first German-American settlement and the great gateway to the subsequent German immigrants. Interesting. So, he founded Germantown after purchasing it off it of the proprietor. The ownership of the state or fact of inclusive rights and control over property which may be any asset, including any object, land or real estate, intellectual property or until the 19th century human beings. Right. Slave masters. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 sure. Nice one. So, if William Penn sells him 15,000 acres, Francis Daniel Pastorius comes over, creates Germantown, and brings with him lots of German immigrants. The German Society of Pennsylvania, eh? let's look at this Germantown, is an area in northwest Philadelphia founded by German, Quaker, and Mennonite families in 1683 as an independent borough. <coughs> really? completely resetting the place, aren't they? These are the writers of our history, by the way. It's becoming more and more evident that these people just do what the hell they want. So, just to continue on that front, we've, uh, we'll have another little look back at William Penn for a moment. And there's a few things that I missed out here well worth a look at. Penn became a close friend of George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, whose movement started in the 1650s during the tumult of the Cromwellian Revolution. The Times sprouted many new sects beside Quakers, including Seekers, Ranters, Antinomians, Seventh-day Baptists, Soul Sleepers, Adamites, Diggers, Levelers, Benemists, Muggletonians, and many others, as the Puritans were more tolerant than the monarchy had been. Following Oliver Cromwell's death, <laughs> good, 
However, the crown was re-established and the king res responded with harassment and persecution of all religions and sects other than Anglicanism. Fox risked his life wandering from town to town and he attracted followers who likewise believed that the God who made the world did not dwell in temples made with hands. Okay. By abolishing the church's authority over the congregation, Fox not only extended the Protestant Reformation more radically, but he helped extend the most important principle of modern political history, the rights of the individual, upon which modern democracies were later founded. <laughs> really. Penn travelled frequently with Fox through Europe and England. He also wrote a comprehensive detailed explanation of Quakerism along with a testimony to the character of George Fox in his introduction to the autobiographical journal of George Fox. In effect, Penn became the first theologian, theorist and legal defender of Quakerism, providing its written doctrine and helping to establish its public standing. And uh, just a few little things just to showcase what these guys are like. Penn in Ireland. In, like, in 1669, Penn travelled to Ireland to deal with many of his father's estates. While there, he attended many meetings and stayed with the leading Quaker families. He became a great friend of William Morris, a leading Quaker figure in Cork, and often stayed with Morris at Castle Salem near Ross Carberry. Must have a huge connection to royalty to have many estates in Ireland. You can guarantee the Irish did not want them there. And here comes some more interesting uh, news on William Penn. And it just goes to show that colonisers are also the resetters of our history and resetting different places. So here we go with Penn in Germany. Between 1671 and 1677, William Penn made trips to Germany on behalf of the Quaker faith, resulting in a German settlement in Pennsylvania that was symbolic in two ways. It was a specifically German-speaking congregation, and it comprised religious dissenters. A little bit like bringing all the Quakers over, right? Pennsylvania has remained the heartland for various branches of Anabaptists, being Old Order Mennonites, Afrita Cloister, Brethren and Amish. Pennsylvania also became home for many Lutheran refugees from Catholic provinces, including Salzburg of Austria, as well as for German Catholics who had been discriminated against in their home country. So I suppose it's like an offshoot. Um, it's funny how, you know, they're not really uh, allowed to do too much yet. They create this whole different sort of facade move. And how funny is that, that you can take loads of settlers with you from your faith to your new place? And even more, founding of Pennsylvania. Seeing conditions deteriorating, Penn decided to appeal directly to the King and the Duke. Penn proposed a solution which would solve the dilemma, a mass immigration of English Quakers. Some Quakers had already moved to North America, but the New England Puritans especially were as hostile towards Quakers as Anglicans in England were, and some of the Quakers had been banished to the Caribbean. What a shame. For everyone else, anyway. In 1677, a group of prominent Quakers that included Penn purchased the colonial province of West Jersey. That same year, 200 settlers from the towns of Chorleywood and Rickmansmer in Hertfordshire and other towns in nearby Buckinghamshire arrived and founded the town of Burlington. Oh, really? Reset the whole place. George Fox himself had made a journey to America to verify the potential of further expansion of the early Quaker settlements. In 1682, East Jersey was also purchased by Quakers. So, by 1682, they somehow own the entire place. Absolutely. Really. It's that easy for them, I suppose, eh? acquired so much wealth when they're going around stealing everything for themselves that they end up just buying the place. Isn't that absolutely fantastic? I hope they're so happy. This is an interesting bit. Penn first called the area New Wales 
<laughs> Pennsylvania, which King Charles II changed to Pennsylvania in honour of the elder Penn. On the 4th of March 1681, the King signed the Charter and followed, and the following day, Penn jubilantly wrote, It is clear and just thing, and my God, who has given it to me through many difficulties, will, I believe, bless and make it the seed of a nation. <laughs> Penn drafted a charter of liberties for the settlement, creating a political utopia, guaranteeing free and fair trial by jury, freedom of religion, freedom from unjust imprisonment, and free elections. Basically rewriting the codes and laws for the place. Absolutely unbelievable. He's an incredible guy. Quillian yeah. Penn. Penultimate challenge. Changed the place completely. Oh, that was another. Ah, let me go back to James Lawrence for a minute. A few things in this too. Didn't really read enough of it. And anyway, like Lawrence was born on October the 1st, 1781, in Burlington, New Jersey, but raised in Woodbury, New Jersey. The son of, the son of John and Martha Tallman Lawrence. His mother died when he was an infant, and his loyalist father fled to Canada during the American Revolution leaving his half-sister to care for the infant. Not a very caring father, is he? Funny enough, though, he's a loyalist. What's that? Well, loyalists were American colonists who remained loyal to the British crown during the American Revolutionary War. Often referred to as Tories, royalists, or king's men at the time. Need I say any more? Core blimey. Loyalists, eh? <laughs> Why don't they remain loyalists to the human race instead? Oh, that was another little thing. Just have a look at with Lawrence. Look at his namesakes and honours. A, just shows they got no imagination, just calling everything by his name. I mean, look how many places that they feel that they own suddenly and put their name to. What a disgrace. Unbelievable. They're just taking land for themselves, for the crown. Anyway, moving on. Hugh Martha was a Scottish soldier and physician. He initially served with the Jacobite forces of Bonnie Prince Charlie and with the British forces during the Seven Years' War, but later became a Brigadier General in the Continental Army and a close friend to George Washington. Aren't they on different sides? Mercer died as a result of his wounds, received at the Battle of Princeton, and became a fallen hero as well as a rallying symbol of the American Revolution. Well, he's Scottish, isn't he? So... <laughs> Mercer was born at Pitsaligo Mons, near Rose Hearty in Aberdeenshire. Right. Yes, he's very American. Very American indeed. He also named Mercer County. <laughs> Mercer County. It was named for Continental Army General Hugh Mercer. Railway. Well, that looks like a nice place. I think I'll put my name to it. So, as it said, it's a close friend of George Washington. Is that behind the scenes? Oh, we all know who George Washington was, but let's just have a little read up of him for a moment. George Washington was an American political leader, military general, statesman, and founding father who served as the first president of the United States. <laughs> 1789 Previously, he had led Patriot forces to victory in the nation's war for independence. <laughs> That's what you do for independence, is it? You create, create war. <laughs> well, I don't see fighting as freedom, do you? Fight for freedom, how does that make sense? Does, does fighting not... Uh, is that not like the opposite of uh, freedom? <laughs> father of his country, to his manifold leadership in the formative days of the new nation. Well, I, well, that's just for a second. 
just a very split second, have a look at his early life, just to see where he was from, really. The Washington family was a wealthy Virginia family that made its fortune in land speculation. What's that? Speculation is the purchase of an asset with the hope that it will become more valuable in the near future. They're all doing that. Washington's great-grandfather, John Washington, immigrated in 1656 from Sulgrave, Northamptonshire, England. Really? I would have never guessed, ever, that there's a link to the UK. <laughs> They're just a bit too obvious on these guys, aren't they? Who else is involved? Well, we've got here Charles Cornwallis, the first Marquess of Cornwallis. A trusty noble. Cornwallis styled Vis Viscount Brome between 1753 and 1762 and known as the Earl Cornwallis. Was a British Army general and official in the United States and the United Kingdom. He's best remembered as one of the leading British generals in the American War of Independence. Uh, let's have a little look at him. This is his surrender in 1781 to a combined American and French force at the Siege of Yorktown ended significant hostilities in North America. Really? He later served as a civil and military governor in Ireland. What the hell's he doing there as well? Where he helped bring out about the Act of Union. Really? And in India, where he helped enact the Cornwallis Code and the Permanent Settlement. My word. The Acts of Union 1800 were parallel acts of the Parliament of Great Britain and the Parliament of Ireland, which united the Kingdom of Great Britain and the Kingdom of Ireland to create the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. What a load of absolute bollocks, isn't it? Hmm? Act of Union. Basically writing into code that you can do what the hell you want. Ireland is not yours. Get out, that's what I say. Get the hell out. They're, they're still there today, aren't they? They've literally been there for about 950 years trying to ruin it. There must be something very important with Ireland. And let's look how ancient it is. Come on, it's so obvious. And Celtic. Possibly ancient. Tartaria or something, I'm not quite sure. But there's, there's many reasons why they're there. And in India, where he helped enact the Cornwallis Code, is a body of legislation enacted in 1793 by the East India Company to improve the governance of its territories in India. The code was developed under the guidance of Charles, Earl, Lord Cornwallis, who served as governor of Bengal. Really? Again, just writing into code exactly what the fuck they can do. Disgrace. What's the Permanent Settlement? Also known as the per Permanent Settlement of Bengal was an agreement between the East India Company and Bengali landlords. And who are the Bengali landlords? <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I really, really wonder. Born into an aristocratic family and educated at Eton and Cambridge, Cornwallis joined the army in 1757. Well, I'm not being rude, but if you were properly educated, you'd probably realise that war sucks. Unless you're one of them. Seeing action in the Seven Years' War, upon his father's death in 1762, he became Earl Cornwallis and entered the House of Lords. That's what it takes, is it? To be one of the special lords. The lords of the manor. Lords of a nation, of the world, the universe. Right, shut up. From 1766 until 1805, he was a colonel of the 33rd. Regiment of Foot. What's that? The 33rd Regiment of Kicking the Crap out of everybody that's not British. It was Line Infantry Regiment of the British Army. So, we've got the East India Company. We've got Act of Union, the Cornwallis Code, and the Permanent Settlement of Bengal. Really? I don't like you very much. I'm sure there's... Oh, what's this? 
Despite his defeat, Cornwallis retained the confidence of successive British governments <laughs> and continued to enjoy an active career. <laughs> Is that what they call it? I like that, yeah. You should have a list. How many countries have you effed up, Gov? Right. He was knighted in 1786. He was in that year appointed to be Governor General and Commander in Chief in India. I'm sure the Indians love that. Again, as we noted, India has a lot of, again, ancient history and uh, some very totalitarian things going on there as well. So a lot of uh, a lot of a cover up, and I think that that's one reason these people have become Commanding Chief of India. There he enacted numerous significant reforms <laughs> within the East India Company and its territories, including the Cornwallis Code, part of which implemented important land taxation reforms. Oh, Raleigh. Make them pay for where they live, even though you just come in and stole it. From 1789 to 1792, he led British and company forces in the Third Anglo-Mysore War to defeat the Mysorean ruler, Tipu Sultan. What the hell's that? The conflict in South India between the Kingdom of Mysore and the East India Company. I see what you mean by significant reforms. Yeah, yeah. I think you like might be getting the idea here as well as I read through this, huh? It's just interesting, isn't it? I think my Wikipedia page might be a bit nicer than this. If they make one, I don't think so. Returning to Britain in 1794, Cornwallis was given the post of Mar Master General of the Ordnance. Yeah, of course he was. What a stunning chap. 1798, he was appointed Lord Lieutenant and Commander-in-Chief of Ireland. Jesus Christ. Wept, was the next verse, where he oversaw the response to the 1798 Irish Rebellion. Well, of course they're going to rebel. They don't like you. They don't want you there. And guess what? Yeah, you're still there now, aren't you? Ghosting around. <laughs> Including a French invasion of Ireland and was instrumental in bringing about the union, the union of Great Britain and Ireland. <laughs> forced union. Don't you just love forced companionship? Aren't you so in love when you're in a forced companionship? Following his Irish service, Cornwallis was the chief British signatory to the 1802 Treaty of Amiens and was reappointed to India in 1805 because he's such a nice guy. He died in India not long after his arrival. <coughs> Good. Excellent. I'm really pleased about that. Shame luck it's all these scumbag cousins there. Anyway, who's next? Stop there for a minute and rejoin the show, And let's just get straight back into it. Here we are, William Cosby. Brigadier General William Cosby was an Irish soldier who served as the British Royal Governor of New York from 1732 to 1736. During his short time as Governor, Cosby was portrayed as one of the most oppressive Royal Governors in the Thirteen Colonies. In 1735, Cosby accused publisher John Peter Zenger of sedition and libel for publishing unflattering reports about Cosby. Really? I wonder why. In spite of Cosby's efforts, Zenger was acquitted of all charges and the case helped to establish the concept of freedom of the press. Raleigh, the freedom of the press. Oh yeah, that's something we see on a daily basis, isn't it? The freedom of the press to exploit the truth. Alrighty. Anyway, one thing I would say, an Irish soldier who served as the British Royal Governor. You're not an Irish soldier if you're working for the British Royals. <clears throat> William Cosby was born in Stradbally Hall, Queen's County, Ireland. Very Irish name, that, isn't it? Queen's County. His father, Alexander Cosby of Stradbally, stemmed from a British family that emigrated to Ireland in 1590 by the first Alexander Cosby. His mother, Elizabeth Lestrange, was from another part of the Protestant ascendancy. Right. Really? Hmm. Don't want to read anymore, really. <laughs> 
freedom of the press. Freedom of the press. The principle of communication expression through various media, including printed and electronic media, especially published materials, should be considered a right to be expressed freely. Such freedom implies the absence of interference from an overreaching state. Its preservation may be sought through constitution or other legal protection and security. How's oh, that how they deal with it? Alright, yes. Constitution or other legal protection and security of a freedom of the press which isn't really free. Well, it's interesting to note this uh, concept of the freedom of the press. Obviously, you know, this guy is very oppressive and he's obviously done a lot of bad things and that's the reason that this uh, reporter John Peter Zenger has come out and, and, and told people and hasn't been afraid to, to tell some home truths. Cosby's not into that. But at the end of the day, the guy was acquitted of all charges. But the fact that it helped to establish the concept of freedom of the press just shows you, again, that that is pretty much where it got altered and changed into what it is today. Because the freedom of the press then would have obviously been that John Peter Zinger can say these things and not be acquitted of all charges, right? But if you think about the establishment of the concept of the freedom of the press, the freedom of the press now is to tell them, tell us whatever they feel like. Uh, that, that the freedom of the press is completely centralised, and all the information we are given is 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 a small part part of the picture. So it just goes to show you that that. Is, is being usurped by these people again the freedom of the press is freedom implies the absence of interference from an overreaching state well <laughs> every bit of press that we get has interference from the overreaching state and if you look here, its preservation may be sought through constitutional other legal protection and security. That's exactly what they've done. They now preserve it through constitution and legal protection and security so that they can say what the hell they want and control the mindset of the public. So I think at this point, I mean, it's, it's good that John Peter Zing has come out and said what he feels like. Um... But again, these people in charge have just completely changed the concept. There is no freedom of the press, except to manipulate society. So again, I think that that's, that's some really interesting information there. Uh, just goes to show you who these people are and what their game is. I'm on to Jonathan Belcher. Isn't he a wonderful looking fellow? He looks so utterly trustworthy. Jonathan Belcher was a merchant, businessman and politician from the province of Massachusetts Bay. During the Amer American colonial period, Belcher served simultaneously for over a decade as colonial governor of the British colonies of New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and later for ten years as governor of New Jersey. Born into a wealthy Massachusetts merchant family, his father Andrew Belcher was a tavern owner in Cambridge, oh, really, and grandfather who immigrated to Massachusetts Bay from England. Oh, crikey, another link to the crown. Incredible. Raleigh. Belcher was appointed governor of New Jersey in 1747 with support from its Quaker community. Raleigh. <laughs> Belcher Town, Massachusetts, is named for him. Oh, good, we get to remember him with the lovely Belcher Town. Wunderbar. Let's have a little look. Good old Johnny Belcher. Was born in Cambridge. Province of Massachusetts Bay. Oh, Cambridge in America. Okay. The fifth of seven children. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Personal. 
This is a good one. Belcher's youngest son, Jonathan, was appointed as Chief Justice of the Nova Scotia Supreme Court and as Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. Really? His other son, Andrew, continued in the family business and also served on the Massachusetts Governor's Council. That's why they get away with everything. They create the legal system and put people in place to govern it. Even if they are in the wrong, they can get away with whatever the hell they want at that point, can't they? Really, I'm trading. Really? Hmm. Again, does his son look... Why are they always pointing down here, eh? You want me to kiss your boots? That ain't happening. <laughs> got such a smug git. William Burnett. Who's he? Was a British civil servant and colonial administrator who served as governor of New Jersey and New York and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Born into a position of privilege. His grand godfather became William III of England not long after his birth. And his father, Gilbert Burnett, was later Bishop of Salisbury. Really? Active for most of his life in intellectual pursuits, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. Absolutely. In order to implement a colonial policy, preferring direct trade with the Native Americans in Central America. New York rule was marked by an increase in political divisions between landowners and merchants. So splitting it all up and dividing it and getting what he wants from the trade. Interesting. Again, that's what they just love to do, isn't it? William Burnett was born in The Hague, a leading city of the Dutch Republic, in March 1687-8. Well, it's one or the other, isn't it? You can't be born in March in both years. He was the first child of Mary Scott Burnett and Gilbert Burnett, the leading theologian in the Dutch court of William, Prince of Orange. William, Prince of Orange, the sovereign Prince of Orange from birth, Stadtholder of Holland, Zealand, Utrecht, Gelders, and over Jussel in the Dutch Republic from the 1670s in King of England, Ireland, and Scotland from 1689. This guy is one of the biggest scumbags you'll ever hear in your history of the world. Prince of Orange, yeah, that's why you've got some orange on the Irish flag. Just shows you what a scumbag he is. Mary Scott Burnett was the heiress of a Scottish family which had settled in the Netherlands and acquired great wealth. Oh, I wonder how they did that. Ooh. Wow. These people, they never stop, do they? It's like Satan has a million faces. Who's the next one? Oh, look at him. Johann Prince. Looks like the most trustworthy person I've ever seen in my life. Honestly, wouldn't you trust him? Why not? What's wrong with you? Is that that weird beady-eyed look he's got? He, he looks like one of them paintings, doesn't he? Where the eyes have been cut out and there's someone staring through it. Really perversely. He was governor from 1643 of the Swedish colony of New Sweden on the Delaware River of North America. Oh, was he really? During the Thirty Years' War, Thirty Years' War was fought primarily in modern Germany and Central Europe. Huh, really? Not a reset going on there for Thirty Years. What's going on there? Destroying Tartaria, are you? Yeah, I bet. Right, during the Thirty Years' War, he initially became a mercenary for Archduke Leopold of Austria, Duke Christian of Brunswick, and King Christian IV of Denmark. Prince entered the Swedish army in 1625, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel under King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden. He was dismissed from service for surrendering the Saxon town of Chemnitz. He got one wrong, did he, and uh, out, you go, out you go. Well, you lost that town, did you? Good. 
Archbold Leopold of Austria was Holy Roman Emperor. Was he really? <laughs> the story deepens. King of Hungary, Croatia and Bohemia. Right, okay. Well, we're going to have to look at him, aren't we? I'm going to be researching the Holy Roman Empire, so watch out for that. He'll be involved in that one. That'll be coming within the next month or so. Keep your eyes peeled. Well, I think we'll move on from the most trustworthy looking bloke we've ever seen in our life. Let's see who's next. Someone else really untrustworthy, I suppose. Walter Van Twiller was an employee of the Dutch West India Company and the fourth director of New Netherland. He governed from 1632 until 1638, succeeding Peter Minwe, who was recalled by the Dutch West India authorities in Amsterdam for unknown reasons. Ooh, is he really? What the van thriller? The Dutch West India Company. Isn't it great? Not really. Anyone ever heard of that company? Let's have a look at them. Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> it's the East India Company. They're all related, of course. We'll have a look into them in a bit. In fact, we'll do a show on those. We'll show exactly what they were doing. Because they were going around destroying Tartaria. That's what they were doing. That's one thing I think, anyway. Peter Minwe was from Tournai in present-day Belgium, the third director of the Dutch North American colony of New Netherland. He founded the Swedish colony of New Sweden on the Delaware Peninsula in 1638. The bit I really love, Minui is generally credited with orchestrating the purchase of Manhattan Island for the Dutch from the Lenape Native Americans. Manhattan later became the site of the Dutch city of New Amsterdam, and the borough of Manhattan of modern day in New York City. A common account states that Minwe purchased Manhattan for $24 worth of trinkets. A letter written by Dutch merchant Peter Shangen to directors of the Deep Dutch East India Company stated that Manhattan was purchased for 60 guilders worth of trade, an amount worth approximately $1,143 in 2020. <laughs> wow, and how much is a house now? Wow, really. So, Peter Minwee, Peter Minwee, was born at Wessel between 1580 and 1585 into a Calvinist family. That had moved from the city of Turnal in the southern Netherlands to Wessel in Germany in order to avoid Spanish Catholic colonials who were not favourably disposed towards Protestants. His surname means midnight in French. Okay, what is a Calvinist family? Well, Calvinism is a major branch of Protestantism that follows a theological tradition and forms of Christian practice set down by John Calvin and other Reformation era theologians. They go Reformation era theologians. There you go. So, basically, reforming the world, reforming our thoughts, reforming the way we live. How that. To, to what they want, to how they see fit. Very intriguing. Minwe joined the Dutch West India Company probably in the mid-1620s and was sent with his family to New Netherland in 1625 to search for tradable goods other than the animal pelts that then were the major product coming from New Netherland. He returned in the same year and in 1626 was appointed the new director of New Netherland, taking over from Willem Verhulst. Verhulst. He sailed to North America and arrived in the colony on May the 4th, 1626. Minwe is accredited with purchasing the island of Manhattan from the Native Americans in, in exchange for traded goods valued at 60 guilders. According to the writer Nathaniel Benchley, Minwe conducted the transition transaction with Cessais, chief of the Canasses, who were only too happy to accept valuable merchandise, merchandise in exchange for an island that was mostly controlled by the Wek. Quas geeks. Something sounds weird about that. Doesn't sound quite right, does it? Okay, they might have been neighbouring tribes that didn't like each other, but what, you just take a bit of money and what, what are they going to do with that? A 
contemporary purchase of rights in nearby Staten Island, to which Minwee was also party, involved duffel cloth, iron kettles, axe heads, hose, wampum, drill, drilling awls, juice harps, and diverse other wares. If similar trade goods were involved in the Manhattan arrangement, Burroughs and William Wallace surmise, then the Dutch were engaged in high-end technology transfer, handing over equipment of enormous usefulness in tasks ranging from clearing land to drilling one pump. Well, one pump is traditional shell bead. Really, clearing land, technology transfer. Also called transfer of technology is the process of transferring technology from the personal organization, organization that owns or holds it to another person or organization. These transfers may occur between universities, businesses, governments, blah, blah, blah. Really? Do you not mean just uh, what you're finding? You, you, you grab what you can find and... You've got some really high-end technology here. Is this some of the high-end technology that you still use today but hide from society? Is this the technology transfer, the high-end technology that we will find hidden in the ground of the mud-flooded Tartarian areas of this world? I bet it is. Very interesting. High-end technology transfer. Wow. I'd like to know what the technology was. Very interesting. Peter Minwee. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Peter Minwee. East India Company. Well, we're going to look into those on another one. But they're heavily linked to all this and the reformation, as we've spoke about before, of this realm. As they thieve it for themselves and reset it how they feel fit. Who's next? Peter Stuyvesant. Again, he looks so utterly trustworthy. In Dutch, also Peter Peter Stuyvesant served as the last Dutch Director General of the colony of New Netherland from 1647 until it was ceded provisionally to the English in 1664. He's a major figure in the early history of New York City. Right. Really interesting. Accomplishments as Director General included great expansion for the settlement of New Amsterdam beyond the southern tip of Manhattan. Among the projects built by Stuyvesant's administration were the protective wall on Wall Street. Really? Mm, what's that for? The canal that became Broad Street and Broadway. Stuyvesant himself, a member of the Dutch Reformed Church. Oh, the Stolen Church. The usurpers opposed religious pluralism and came into conflict with Lutherans, Jews, Roman Catholics, oh, and Quakers, oh, rather, as they attempted to build place of worship in the city and practice their faiths. However, Stuyvesant particularly supported anti-Semitism and loathed Jews, not merely through religion, but also through race. Really? So... You've got a colonial governor who's racist. Very nice. Excellent. Again, links to the Dutch India Company, Dutch West India Company. Let's see, he was sent, then sent to Amsterdam by his father, West Stuyvesant, now using the Latinized version of his name, Petrus, to indicate that he had universal university schooling, joined the Dutch West India Company, in 1630, the company assigned him to be their commercial agent on a small island just off Brazil. Right. Really? In 1638, he was moved again, this time to the colony of Curacao, the main Dutch naval base in the West Indies. Well, just four years later, age 50, he became the acting governor of that colony, as well as Aruba and Bonaire, a position he held until 1644. Right. Again, just doing what they feel like, really. Religious freedom. <laughs> so you want religious freedom, yet you're a racist? <laughs> okay, just a little look at him. Don't like him either. 
John Berkeley of the 1st Baron Berkeley of Stratton was an English royalist soldier, politician and diplomat of the Bruton branch of the Berkeley family. From 1648 he was closely associated with James, Duke of York, and rose to prominence, fortune and fame. He and Sir George Carteret were the founders of the province of New Jersey, a British colony in North America that would eventually become the U.S. state of New Jersey. Again, he looks so flippin' untrustworthy. Nice wig. Nice fingernails. Did he paint them? Oh look, he's involved with the first single civil war. He's in exile. After the restoration, on the restoration, Berkeley was put on the staff of the Admiralty. 1661, he was appointed Lord President of Connaught, Staten Island. Yep. In the English government of Connaught in Ireland here in the 16th and 17th century, oh, what a lovely guy. For life, a deputy being appointed to do the work of the office in Ireland in 1663. Barclay was sworn a member of the Privy Council and in the following year was made one of the All Masters of Orden Ordnance. Barclay in 1665 was placed on the Committee of Tangier. Privy Council is a body that advises the head of state or the state, typically but not always in a context of monarchic government. Really? An advisor to the Lovely, lovely, lovely owners. Tangier is a northwestern city in Morocco. Right. North Jersey interests. Probably had interest in getting rid of Barclay, I would imagine. Just a little look on him. <coughs> Scumbag. George Carteret, O'Raleigh, was a royal estateman in Jersey and England who served in the Clarendon Ministry as Treasurer of the Navy. He was also one of the original Lords Proprietor of former British colony of Carolina of New Jersey, Carteret, New Jersey, as well as Carteret County, New Carolina, born in North. I've lost me words. He acquired the manor of Haynes in Bedfordshire. Brawler, what a lucky man. Well, again, you know what, on these ones I'm not going to really look that much further. I don't think we really need to, to clarify what they're up to. William Franklin was an American-born attorney soldier, politician, and colonial administrator. Really? Looks very English. Looks very English to me. Early life. Let's see. Anything to do with the UK? Let's have a look. Obtaining the rank of captain. As he grew older, he accompanied his father on several missions, including trips to England. Okay, well, they had trips to England. So he was rather the loyalist of the royalists. He is colonial governor. Involved in the American War of Independence. Did he do that independently for America? Royal society. In 1783, this is Scotland, he was asked to be a founding member of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Even though he's got no links to Scotland. Right. Okay. Franklin. What about Sir William Livingston? An American politician who served as the governor of New Jersey during the American Revolutionary War and was a signer of the United States Constitution. Was he? An American politician? Oh. During the American Revolutionary War? Oh. And a signer of the United States Constitution. Brilliant. Oh. Very intriguing. Oh, look. Yale College. Urale. Livingston was born in Albany, in the province of New York. He was the son of Philip Livingstone. Was he? Let's have a look at him. Philip Livingston. 
I bet he's a lot nicer. The son of Robert Livingston, the elder, and elder brother of Robert Livingston, again, like they like to confuse you with the same name, of Clermont. Philip was the second lord of Livingston Manor, a merchant, oh, and guess what, everybody? A slave trader. Absolutely super. Philip Livingston was the fourth child and second son of Robert Livingston. He was born on July the 9th, 1686, in his father's Albany, New York townhouse. Let's have a look at Robert Livingston the Elder. Robert Livingston the Elder. Oh look, a New York colonial official, fur trader, and of course businessman. He was granted a patent to 160,000 acres along the Hudson River and became the first Lord of Livingston Manor. Sorry, he was granted a patent. Right, sorry, did he design the place, did he? Crikey! And look! Again, he's pointing at his feet! You must kiss me on my feet, you scumbag slave! Get down and lick my bottom! It's rather cold! Really? Let's have a look. I love his coat of arms. Very, very nice. He was born in 1654 in the village of Ancrum, near Jedburgh, in the county of Roxburgh, Scotland. Really? That's great. So basically, he's not American. His family are not even American, really. Well, they're born later, but actually, there's a link. Being the Scottish. Obviously, at that point, a part of the British crown. Absolutely. Kiss my feet, fuddy monster. John Lawrence, the first Baron Lawrence. By between 1858 and 1869, was an English-born Ulsterman. Oh, really? My favourite hand, the Red Hand of Ulster, became a prominent British imperial statesman who served as a viceroy of India. Oh, another Tartarian country you're ruining. Oh, how we love the lords. Really, mate, an Ulsterman. English-born, of course. One of the four traditional Irish provinces in the north of Ireland, it is made up of nine counties. Blah, 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 blah. You've changed the history of the entire country. Now, <clears throat> oh, passage to India. Oh, hell sweet. I bet they wanted to get rid of you rather quickly too, didn't they? Oh, I don't want to read any more of your rubbish, mate. I really don't. And that pretty much ends this show. Let's just have a quick look at some of the images we've already seen. Just a round off. Let's have a look. Oh, that's not a very good picture to start with, is it? Bit small. It's Will Water Van Triller. Oh my god, show me the picture. We must show the agreement so we can ruin these people. Gonna wet you on the air with my stick. You do. But I've got a nice florally platen, haven't we? Oh yes, of course. The drawing of the purchase of Manhattan Island. It happened so sweetly. How did I carry that chest all the way up here? To oh, behold the Indians. Uh, yes. We will give you our land. It is okay. It doesn't belong to us. You just need the land of them again. Hey, I love how they write the story so nicely. They came along. Yeah, we got loads of stuff for you, Gav, yeah. Oh, you're not getting on with them lot. I tell you what, you move on with all our stuff. And we'll have it. Yeah, sure. Ooh, an old map from 1650. Washington, New Marshall, and don't you know England and Virginia? You're Belgy. Really? Colonial masters write the story how they want. Francis Bernard. Again, untrustworthy. 
What's he doing? Is he doing a choir? Look at this. He was affiliated with the Great Awakening. Right, I'll write that down. The Great Awakening. I wonder what that was. More like the complete opposite. The Great Awakening, eh? Maybe there was a Great Awakening, and that's why he's conducting the Death of the Awakened. Oh, look, he's had this. Uh, Jonathan Belcher. Doesn't he look slightly more trustworthy in this picture? It's because he's made himself look good in this one, isn't he? He was a rather ugly sod, wasn't he? And there's his son pointing at his feet. Kiss my boots, fuddy monster. And clip my toenails while you're there. Oh, look, what was that? Oh. <laughs> Belcher's summer home was destroyed in the fire in 1776. Really? <laughs> Never heard of a fire in any of these buildings before. That must be a new one, that. An Irish soldier. No, he wasn't. He served for the British Royal Government. That's not an Irish soldier. Hmm. Mud floody hell, what a building. Sexy baby. <laughs> Look at that deer trying to escape. Oh, I see. I take it that they think that the society's the rabbit and they're the greyhound that's going to chase it. I suppose they don't have a Rottweiler here as well. Pretending that they're both. Ooh, so fearful ass little rabbits. Oh, it's that guy again. Oh, William Burnett. Scum. Uh, yeah, you look really untrustworthy. Pedophile. You've got a look of a pedophile there, haven't you? Mm, Jonathan Belcher. What a lovely guy. Not. And here's the painting. I think that actually he's still alive and he's behind the painting, looking through the eye holes. Weirdo. Very untrustworthy looking. And him. <laughs> Weirdo. Inbred. No, you're not Irish either, Cosby. Get out. No, don't like you. Oh, nice fur. Oh, I like that. Robert Hunter. Oh, yes, of course. Robert Hunter of Hunterdon. Uh, from Ayrshire in Scotland. Later governor in America. And, of course, I'm sure the Jamaicans are really happy when he was the governor there. Nice fur coat. Kiss my feet. No thanks. Scumbag. Oh look, it just looks like they've drawn a penis on the map. They are the penis on the map. Trustworthy, trustworthy, trustworthy. Again, very trustworthy. And that just about ends the show. Excellent. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.